Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. And for the show today, our topic is Google Forms in the Classroom. Our special guest is Melissa Murphy. The show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. Uh, Melissa's blog spot link is here on the main slide. Here's our live binder for today. Um, Peggy will post the link into the, the chat. The link on the slide is not clickable. Our The Classroom 2.0 live binders now have the tabs on the left hand side rather than the top. The recordings for the shows are always posted at the Archives and Resources page, which you can get to from here. Or of course, there is a, a link on the Classroom 2.0 Live site for recordings. Here is where I'm going to ask you to let us know where in the world you're logging in from. And if you use the second tool down in the whiteboard tool set, you'll find the uh, pointer selection, you'll have to push down on the mouse in order to activate it. We do have an international crowd today. Most people are logging in from the United States. Uh, we do have somebody logging in from um, South America as well as Europe today. I am logging in from central Pennsylvania. Peggy's logging in from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. She's actually at EdCamp in Phoenix currently. Tammy's logging in from South Central or Southwest, Southwest Arkansas. I know Melissa's logging in from New Jersey. So here's our first poll question. And again, you vote with the tool underneath your name in bold at the top. Have you ever used Google Forms before? It's either a yes or no. This link won't work, um, but you vote with the Green check for yes, the red X for no. Or you can also type in the in the chat. I'll wait until some more people have had a chance to vote and then publish those to the whiteboard. And it looks like most everybody who's in the room well over, well not over, well over 50%, 71% have used Google Forms before. The next poll question, also yes or no, let me clear the first. Do you currently have a way to collect and store formative assessment data? It's either yes or no. And I will publish those as well. And not quite half said yes to that question. 41% said yes. 32% have not. The next question, have you heard of scripts such as Fluberoo, Doctopus, and G-Class folders? Let me clear that first. And I will publish those to the right whiteboard. And it looks roughly even. We've got 38% voting no, they don't, and 35% voting yes, they do. Again, our topic today is Google Forms in the Classroom. Our special guest is Melissa Murphy. I'm Lori Moffat, one of the co-hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore, who is doing the closed captioning. Melissa is oh, 
I had this already set up and now I've got to find it again. There it is. Sorry about that, folks. Melissa is a 6th to 8th grade self-contained special education teacher in Belmar, New Jersey. She's the Belmar School District Teacher of the Year for 2014. She's a Google certified teacher and she attended Google Teacher Academy in London in December of 2013. Uh, she's a working right now on becoming a Google, Google certified trainer. So I'd like to now turn over the show to Melissa. The newbie question is here, and I'll ask it, and then Melissa, you can begin your presentation here. What are Google Apps and tools? Don't forget to turn on the, the talk button. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting in my very first webinar. So if I speak a little fast or you need me to go back to something, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, oh, and my Aunt Kathy's here. Hi, Aunt Kathy. Uh, <laughs> um, the newbie question for today, what are Google Apps and tools? Um, that's kind of a two-fold answer depending on um, what aspect you're talking about. So just in general, um, people usually think of apps as a mobile uh, on their mobile device, something like Angry Birds or a game that you would put on your iPhone or your iPad. Uh, but Google Apps can be used on your desktop computer. They have a web store that you can download uh, extensions and apps onto the Chrome web browser. And then if you have a Google uh, Gmail account, you also have access to the Google Apps um, such as Google Drive with Google Slides and Forms and uh, Google Docs. And then you also have Google Sites, Google Calendar, lots and lots of tools to use. Um, also, a lot of you may be hearing about Google Apps for Education, which is a little bit different. Uh, Google has two divisions um, of services that they provide, one being um, Google Apps for Business which businesses pay for. And then they offer the same services for schools, and it's all free. So I know Peggy put in some links in the live binder um, if you're interested in getting some information about Google Apps for Education. My school became a Google Apps for Education school about two and a half years ago now. And all of our teachers love it. It has made our workflow so much easier. and today's topic, the Google Forms, has really changed the way that we do assessment, especially formative assessment. So I was interested in those poll questions that many of you said that you had seen Google Forms or used Google Forms before, but maybe haven't been using it for formative assessment. So I hope by the end of today, you'll see some different ways that you can use Google Forms in your class and use it as a way to uh, archive and document your formative assessment, because that's what I use it for uh, most of the time in my classroom. OK, so today, um, just to let you know the flow of how this is going to go, we're going to go over some basics of Google Forms, uh, just the three screens that you're going to become familiar with as you create Google Forms. And then I'm going to go through some of my favorite examples of Google Forms that I've used in my classroom and that some of my colleagues at my school have come up with and that I've used. And also, if we have some time at the end, I'll go through um, how to create a form for some of you that may not have ever seen it, or also how to um, put in some different applications and different tools that people don't use as frequently with Google Forms, so to get a little bit of a different view of them. Uh, so we're going to start off with just some basics of Google Forms. When you start to use them, there's going to be three screens that you need to be familiar with. 
this first screen that you're seeing is what will you will see uh, when you go to create a form um, in your Google Drive. So what will come up will be a screen that will ask you to choose a theme. And once you have chosen a theme, you'll get this screen, which will ask you to uh, start creating questions for your form. There's lots of different question types that you have to choose from. And I'm going to go to um, some examples later on of some different types of questions. But there's uh, fill in the blanks, there's drop downs, there's choose from a list, there's check boxes, and then uh, some newer ones such as uh, putting in a date or a time. And then there's also paragraph boxes. So lots of different types of questions you can put in uh, to your Google form. The second screen that you're going to become familiar with is this one, uh, which is called the live form. At any time while you're creating a Google form, you can check out how it looks um, by clicking uh, in the top of the screen, view the live form. Uh, this is the screen that your students or whoever you're sending the form to will see. They will not see the previous screen, and they will not see the next screen where we talk about uh, where your data is collected. This is all that they would see. The final screen here is the responses to the questions. Uh, so wherever, whatever kinds of questions you set up, as soon as students or participants start to fill in their answers, uh, it will load into a Google spreadsheet automatically um, and in real time. So you can watch as your answers come in uh, just to see how people are answering. And it's also, if you're doing this like at the end of class, uh, it gives you instantaneous feedback about how students are doing. So those are the three screens that you're going to need to become familiar with while you're using Google Forms. Next, I'm going to show you some examples of some of my favorite forms that others have created and that I've created um, in, to use in my classroom. So this first form is actually the very first one I created. Uh, Last year, we started uh, some Google training with Rich Piker, who is a Google certified trainer. And he came to our district to provide some professional development on Google. And we're still receiving uh, some training from him. And our first task was just to create a very simple exit ticket. So one that I created uh, is just a 3 to one exit ticket. And I'm going to share my screen here. Oops. There we go. Uh, so this is my exit ticket that I created. Um, so what I did, I started at the top with just what is today's learning objective, what was the topic that we talked about, and then a 3 to one exit ticket being uh, named three things you worked on today, two things you found interesting, and one question you still have. Um, you can notice right here uh, that one of the problems with Google Forms, if you're going to share them with people, is that you have to remember to make a copy of the form. Um, this particular instance, uh, okay, somebody. So, sorry to interrupt, Melissa. For some reason, we're not. OK, there it goes. Is everyone else suddenly showing now? It was just a little delayed in popping open, but we see it now. OK, I'm sorry about that. Um, so this was an example of a 3 to one exit ticket. However, um, when oh, you share oh, something sorry, like Melissa, a Google sorry, form. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry to have to j jump in again. Uh, could you yeah. restart it for us, the, the app share? What it's doing for some reason, I've never seen it do that before, is it's just showing the Collaborate instead of showing your, um, instead of showing your app. Try the option. Oh, there we go. That looks good. That looks good. Thanks. You can see it now. Yeah, the oops, uh, we had it for a second. It was white with the with orange text for the forms. Does that sound like that's about right? Okay, I'm thinking we've got it now. Sorry to interrupt the flow. Right. That's okay. I've never used this before, so I'm new to it. Um, so this is just the example of the form. And like I was saying, anytime you share a Google Doc with someone, 
or a Google form, whatever it is, if they don't make a copy, they're going to mess up what you had originally created. So um, you'll see here that it's actually a 323 uh, <laughs> exit ticket. Uh, it should be a 321. So obviously somebody was playing with this, uh, with the link that I shared out, and uh, maybe rearranged the questions a little bit. So. Just as a side note, whenever you are going to take a copy of someone's uh, form or something, you're more than welcome to take copies of mine. But please, 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 please make sure you make a copy of your own before you start editing the form. All right, so let's go back to the screen. OK, this should be the whiteboard now. Am I, am I good? <laughs> OK. Um, so that was just an example of an easy exit ticket that you could create. Um, when I first wanted to make an exit ticket, I wanted one that I could push out um, just at any time. It didn't have to be content specific. It was just something that uh, you know could be pushed out for any subject area, any topic, just to get a quick uh, you know poll of the class and see what everyone was understanding, what they liked and uh, maybe what I needed to reteach the next day. So that was my first uh, example of an exit ticket that I created. The next one here is a group work exit ticket. Um, my students do collaborative projects, um, but I'm sure all of you have experienced those students in your class who end up doing most of the work for the group and then are a little too shy to talk about it Maybe they don't want to come to you in front of the rest of their group mates because they don't want to get anybody in trouble. So this is an example of a form that you could push out at the end of some group work and let your students give you some feedback about how their group worked together without uh, students having to feel like they're tattling on each other. So this is a copy of the group work exit ticket. So it asks the students to give their name and their group number at the top. And then you'll see some different kinds of questions on this form. Uh, this is a rating scale, which you can adjust however many point values you want to include on your rating scale. Um, this one is a 1 to 5 rating. And it lets you choose how you want to phrase the rating. So if you want one to be the lowest and five to be the highest, um, it lets you fill in that information. So you choose how the rating scale goes. So just two examples of some rating questions. And then we have a drop down here. What did you contribute to the group? So it gives them a couple options. And then also ask the students to talk about what they want to accomplish the next time they are in class. So it might be uh, students asking for help. It might be them just telling you what they need to work on in the next class period, depending on how much they had gotten done. So that's just an example of a group work exit ticket. Okay, the next exit ticket, the next uh, form here is actually one that was created by one of my peers at school, and we used these forms um, to test grammar skills that we had taught in our first ELA unit. Uh, some of the grammar skills in uh, the Common Core seem isolated um, or things that you might not always get to depending on what story you're reading. So we wanted to teach the grammar in isolation first and then you know always talk about it later on um, when we would encounter it in a story. So this is an example of a pre and post assessment that we gave our students. So what we did was we just created four sentences, and they had to choose whether the sentence was written in active or passive voice. So we would give this pre-assessment to the students at the beginning of the class. And then after our mini lesson on act, um, active and passive voice, we would send them the same form with the same questions, and then we would be able to compare the data and see if students had a better understanding of active and passive voice by the end of the mini lesson. So we did this for a couple different grammar topics. Um, 
during a week of our first unit, and we got some great data back from our students about how much they had learned about those grammar topics during that week. So this was a really helpful form. Um, obviously, I'm sure you can think of many topics that would lend themselves to mini lessons that you could pre and post assess very quickly, and you would have that data right away to use in your class. OK, so now we're going to move on to one of my favorite uses for forms. And this is uh, what I use when I do station teaching in my math class. Um, as you were told at the beginning of the uh, conference here, um, I teach three grade levels at the same time. I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade self-contained language arts and math and science. So it's, uh, it's very busy, and I do a lot of station teaching because students um, need to be working with their grade level curriculum. And math, especially with the Common Core, uh, the emphasis on different topics is different. Um, so the grade levels need to be separated when we're doing math instruction on the whole. So what I do is I run stations with my students. And one station would be students working with me um, on new material. One station is students working as a group on a game or a review. And then the last station would be a Google form just like this one. So this is an example of a form um, from my sixth graders who were learning about positive and negative numbers. One of my favorite uh, websites to use for videos is LearnZillion. They have wonderful, wonderful videos that break down uh, topics on the Common Core, and they break each um, they break each topic down into manageable units, so the students don't get overwhelmed with you know having to sit there for 20 minutes to learn everything there is to know about positive and negative numbers. So this was just an example of positive and negative numbers on the number line. It's a four minute video that I was able to embed into my form. So when my students were at the independent workstation, they sit down with their Chromebook and they watch a three to four minute video. Um, like I said, I use LearnZillion a lot. Uh, I use Khan Academy. Uh, the only restriction you have as far as importing um, videos into a Google form is that they have to be on YouTube. You can't upload a video that you created unless you uploaded it to YouTube first. So obviously we all know that YouTube is a great resource. However, if your school does not allow YouTube, obviously this is going to be an issue. Um, YouTube is open at my school, so I'm able to input these videos into my forms, and then my students will answer um, some comprehension questions about the video and possibly some application questions uh, to take the skills that they learn in the video uh, and apply it to something else. So you see here we have some different types of questions. Uh, we have a multiple choice. We have the drop down and then we have the fill in the blank. So students will answer this on their own time and I usually give them about 15 minutes to get through the video. I usually ask them to watch it twice, one time just all the way through without stopping, and then one time if they need to copy down a definition or they want to rewatch something, I usually make sure they have enough time to go through the video at least twice and to fill in their answers. So this is a form, an example of a form that I use on a daily basis with my students. Okay. Next, um, this is another forum that was created by one of my uh, colleagues. It is a vocabulary quiz. Um, we had typically given vocabulary tests paper and pencil, but once we had the option of doing Google Forms and we had students with one-to-one -one Chromebooks in our middle school, it just became the easier option to try and do things uh, in a paperless fashion. So this is just an example of how we administer um, our 
vocabulary test to our students now. So it's the same questions that we would have asked on the paper test, just uh, imported to the Google form. So students answer multiple choice questions, and then they have to write sentences with context clues. And then uh, this particular unit, we were talking about derivatives. So they had to put in the derivative of the vocabulary word. So you can see that we're asking the same content, but we're doing it in a paperless fashion. And then um, teachers could run Fluberoo, um, which is a script from the script gallery in uh, Google Spreadsheets. Um, if this was all multiple choice and drop down and fill in the and fill in the blank that is a you know one word answer or something that you're going to get a specific answer you could run Fluberoo. Um, you wouldn't really want to run Fluberoo with this uh, quiz because every student's sentences are going to be the same, um, so you wouldn't really be able to run it with this particular form. Um, but Fluberoo does make grading a lot faster, and I don't know if I'll get to Fluberoo today, um, but maybe I'll come back someday and uh, show you how to use Fluberoo with your Google Forms and your Google Spreadsheets. Okay. This is the last example of a Google Form that I uh, have created. This Google form I used with my eighth graders before we had a test on scientific notation. And actually, I was able to present this form at uh, the Google Teacher Academy when I went in December. I had submitted you know, this form that I created, and I got to present it to my colleagues, which was a great experience. Um, so this form is taking what I had done with the embedding the videos, and kind of takes it a step further because this is a test review. So what I did was I found videos that reinforce skills that I wanted to review with my students. And I had created several pages of questions and videos to review certain skills. Um, again, you'll see here that we're supposed to be doing standard form to scientific notation. And this one is multiplying and dividing. So somebody was obviously playing around with this form and forgot to make a copy. So again, just here's my little side note about make sure you make a copy before you edit anything. But anyway, um, this is a multi-page form with videos embedded. Uh, I am a special ed teacher, and I find that my students tend to get a little overwhelmed if there's too much information on one page. Um, so I made sure to make a multi-page Google form here so that each page had one video with questions that apply to that specific video. And I'm just going to page through here. So the first page was uh, standard form scientific notation. This page has a video of scientific notation back to standard form and some questions that have to do with that. And then an application question to make sure they understood uh, the topic. And you can see down here at the bottom there's a little uh, percentage bar that shows them how much they have left. Okay, so that's where the missing video went. <laughs> there's supposed to be a video on this page um, talking about multiplying and dividing in scientific notation. And then another application question. Um, so why is this uh, not correct scientific notation? Uh, so students you know, have to analyze what's wrong with the scientific notation here. And then on the last page, this is actually a chance for the students to reflect on uh, the video review and also how prepared they feel for the test the next day. Um, when I am giving a test, I'll typically have my students do this Google form as their first station. And I can look at the results in real time in that spreadsheet. And students can, uh, talk, you know, can select which topics that they need some further review on. Uh, so that way, when they come to my station, I know which topics they're confident about and which ones um, certain students might need review on. So this is something that I can have them do at the beginning of the period 
and by the end, by the um, time they're coming to my station, I already know what needs to be reviewed. And then additional questions and comments. So those were all my examples that I had put into the uh, slideshow here, but I actually came up with one more example uh, that I used yesterday in my class. Um, my students just got finished reading the book Freak the Mighty, uh, which is a great, great novel for middle school. And I'm having my students, uh, after we took our final book test, I also like to give a performance test. So my students are creating a book trailer using the website Animoto. And they've used it before, so they're very comfortable with the website. However, creating the videos takes different students different amounts of time, depending on uh, things that we had benchmarks going on this week. So I just was never sure which students had gotten almost to the end of their video and which students needed some more time. So you'll see on this form that I asked my students to select which parts of the video they're completely finished with. Um, so I had given them the directions that they needed a title slide. They needed to show a picture and describe five characters from the book. And then they needed to give a summary of the story. So students could select, uh, you know, I finished the first two, but I'm not done with the last one yet or maybe I haven't even started. So they could select what they, where their progress was. And then I asked them, how many character slides do you have complete? Uh, what part of the plot are you working on? And is there anything you need my help on? You'll notice that the first question has this little uh, red symbol next to it, this little star. And this is a required question, which means my students have to answer um, this question. But the rest of the questions are not required. Um, typically, when you give something like a quiz or you're giving a formative assessment, you want all the questions to be required. But here, I didn't require all the questions because uh, you know some of them might not have even started. So to put in zero characters doesn't really help because I know they haven't even started based on the first question. This last question type down here is one that not everyone is familiar with. This is a date question. And it's, I asked my students to pick a day next week that they would meet with me to talk about their projects. So students that were either almost completely done and just needed some guidance on what to fix, or if there were students that were completely confused by the assignment, I asked them to make an appointment early in the week with me, so they might select Monday, even though we might have a snow day on Monday now. Um, but I had them select a day early in the week to talk with me. And then I told them, you know, if you've been working on your project, you know you still have a little bit to go, but you feel confident, maybe select a day later in the week um, that you're going to meet with me. So I had them, you know, kind of think about where they were in the process and decide from there what day they would like to meet with me to talk about their project. So that kind of puts the ownership back in their hands and uh, gives them a choice uh, when they're ready to share their work with me. All right, so that is kind of in a nutshell some of the um, uses of forms that I've had in my class. I have a couple different forms that were um, on my website, on my blog, that you might want to check out. I believe there was one that was a uh, reading inventory, which was really great. Um, and there might be some more examples over there. So you might want to check those out. And uh, now we're going to get into a little bit of how to create a form. And then maybe some I'll have a chance to show you some cool things that we can do with forms once you have already collected some data. So let's go back and kind of go through how to create a form and some of these cool tools that some people might not have seen before, what we can do there. So when you first open up a new form, they're going to ask you to put in a title. And they're going to ask you to choose a background here. Um, whatever you choose at this point can be fixed. You don't have to be married to whatever theme you choose. You can change it at any point. Uh, in the process here, 
So I'm just going to make this an example. Ah, there we go. Okay. And when you get into the form, this is, uh, like I said, this is the basic view of the form that you're going to have to create from scratch. Um, you're going to see some different settings up at the top in my screen than you would see in your screen. Um, I am using my school account right now. Um, and if your school is a Google Apps for Education school, then you will see some similar uh, buttons up at the top for your settings. So one nice thing about being a Google Apps school, and there's lots of nice things about it, but um, I don't have to have a box for my students to put their names in um, because I can automatically collect their uh, username. Um, and it makes it so that the students have to be signed into their email or their, uh, you know, their Google accounts. And then it'll automatically uh, put their Google username in when they submit their answers. So that way, we don't need to have the students put in their names. And you don't have to worry about somebody putting in somebody else's name or anything like that. So this is a very helpful part of Google Apps for Education. And if you're just doing this on a personal account, you're not going to see this button. So you are going to have to have your first uh, question or two be something that will identify the student. So maybe their student number, maybe their email address, depending on what you're going to do with it. So you can see that the first question is always going to default to multiple choice. Um, if you click down on the multiple choice, it's going to give you all of your different types of questions. So a text box question would just have um, the student type their answer into the box. Uh, paragraph text is just if you expect something a little bit longer. This you know, gives your students the hint that you need to type more than one or two words to answer this question. So that's your paragraph text box. We saw the multiple choice. You saw the check boxes um, earlier in some of my examples. Check boxes are very helpful if you are giving a question that students need to be able to give more than one answer for. Then we also have choose from a list, which is a drop down, much very similar to this box right here. And you might want to use these kinds of questions if you have lots of choices and you don't want it to take up as much room. Or if you're like me, that has students who can be very easily distracted, um, it's a good idea to use the drop down so that there's not as much information on the page readily available. There's also the scale question, which I talked about earlier. Um, you can have the scale go from 1 to 10 being the highest, or you can choose anywhere in the middle. It'll default to 5. And then you would put in your label of what you want 1 to represent and what you would like 5 to represent. And everything in the middle will kind of fall on that continuum. We have the date question, which is what I included at the end of my Animoto form, where the students were going to pick a day to meet with me. So this might be helpful if you are going to be scheduling something with your students, um, such as a conference. Or if you had something uh, like you taught history and you wanted them to put in a, you know, a date of a certain battle or someone when they were born or when they died, uh, that might be a helpful question type. And then you also have time. Um, you know, maybe you're creating a math assessment and you're working on elapsed time uh, that you want your students to put in what time something occurred at, you know, just as an example. Then you also have a grid question, which will um, form a table. And students can fill in results in the table. So lots of different types of questions that you can choose from in your Google Forms. Um, also, if you take a look underneath your questions, you'll see this little Add Item box. And the drop down for the Add Item has even more um, has the question types that we talked about, the basic questions, the advanced questions, and then some newer sections where you can insert your images, insert a video, a page break, or a section head. So because I talked about using the videos, I just wanted to show you how to insert a video into your um, Google Form. As I mentioned, the only videos that you can embed right now in your Google Forms are from YouTube. 
Um, so there's two ways you can do it. You can think about um, a topic that you want your students uh, to learn about through their Google form. Um, so it might be fractions to decimals. And it'll search and bring up some examples of fraction to decimal videos. And you can actually watch them right in your window here. Or if you already know a URL of a video you would like to insert, you can go ahead and do it this way. Um, that's what I usually do. I usually will have YouTube open in a separate window that's a little larger. And I'll pick my videos ahead of time. But if you are in a rush, you can always use this video search and put in your videos that way. So I'm just going to pick a fractions to decimal video just to show you how you can adjust the video once you have it inside your Google form. So when you put it in the Google form, it's going to ask you, do you want to put a title or caption? I usually don't, um, but that's obviously a personal choice. Uh, students typically want the videos pretty large. It's going to default to this size for the most part. Um, but you can stretch it and center it in your form. Uh, so uh, you know, if you have these blue boxes around it, you can just pull and make it larger. Um, so that way students can watch the video right in the form and don't have to open it in a separate window. And I find that works the best uh, for my students if it's nice and large. Once you hit Done, you can drag the video up to the top if you want it at the top of your form and then have the questions underneath. Um, another good part about Google Forms, it didn't always used to be this way, but now you can drag the questions and drop them wherever you would like. Uh, so you don't have to worry about um, you know, changing your mind about the order of the questions. You can drag and drop them as you like. Uh, very similar to video, you can import images. Um, here you have a little bit more option. Uh, then with videos, you can upload images from your computer. You can take a snapshot, or if you have the picture in your URL. And then you can also access your Google Drive. So if you have pictures in your Google Drive, you can upload that way. Or you can do a search of Google Images, or Life Images, or Stock Images. So there's lots more options here um, when you want to insert an image. I had a uh, the art teacher at my school want to know if she could create a form to have students analyze a piece of art. And I said, as long as they can Google it and find the picture, you can absolutely put that into your form. So that's not a problem. And then finally, this is the page break is where um, how I created the different pages for my uh, students. Again, you know, having special ed students not wanting them to be overwhelmed by too much on one page. Um, I created a couple different pages of questions. Uh, so on your side of the form, which we're looking at right now, it's only going to be on one page. But when you go up here to the top and click View Live Form, it will open up what you've been working on. And you can move to the second page this way. So you'll be able to see um, how your students will see it. Uh, from their side. So view live form, like I mentioned, is always available. You can do it at any point in the process. And you'll see exactly how your students will see it from their side. And then there's also section header, which I didn't really get into. But um, you can add you know, a section of page two, one section being uh, you know, standard form to scientific notation, and the other section being scientific notation back to standard form. So you can put in some section headers as well. All right, the last thing, oh, there's my Twitter. <laughs> um, I believe that is all I had. Um, we, I have some time to show some things that you can do with data. Um, but I don't know, do we want to stop and take some questions first? Or should I just go and, and show some things to do with the data? And then uh, Melissa, I was asked to jump in to uh, ask some questions right now. And there were lots of questions in chat. And when you're app sharing, usually you don't see the chat fly by. So let me go ahead and start with the questions. Sure. 
how does a teacher become a, certi a Google certified teacher? That is a great question. Um, so the, there's two, um, two different titles now that are pretty similar. There's Google certified teacher and there's Google educators. Uh, so a Google certified teacher, you have to go to, you have to be selected to attend a Google teacher academy. Um, to apply for that, you have, there's essays that you're going to complete and you have to make a video um, using some sort of video editing software. Um, and they, there's usually a couple different topics you can make your video about. Um, I believe I used mine, I made mine about uh, how Google and the Common Core work together. So you su submit a video and some essays. Uh, there are only a couple teacher academies a year, and they select 50 people for each teacher academy. So it is um, very prestigious to be selected. And usually they have anywhere from a few hundred to a thousand applicants per teacher academy. Um, I haven't heard of a new one coming around. The last two were in December, um, was mine that I went to in London, and then there was one in Stockholm the week after. So I haven't heard of any more um, teacher academies, but I believe Peggy had put up the website that you could visit. And when they do decide to have another teacher academy, you would apply through there. Thank you. Someone asked about how much time do students get when they fill out either their exit tickets or their um, surveys during for a particular topic. Sure. Uh, so an exit ticket, you know, if you think about how long you would give your students on a paper exit ticket, you really don't need that much longer um, to do the Google form. So I'd say I probably leave about five minutes at the end of class for students to fill out mm -hmm. an exit ticket. Um, like I mentioned with the video embedded forms, I usually give them about 15 to 20 minutes depending on how long the videos are. So it, it varies um, depending on your purpose. Um, but you can get one done in two or three minutes if you just make it one question, uh, you know, something that's just going to capture if they receive the content from that day. You could make them very quickly and students would be able to fill them out pretty quickly. Someone just asked, what devices do you have in your classroom that students use? Okay. Um, so my school, we, like I said at the beginning, um, we became a Google Apps for Education school about two and a half years ago, and we started going one-to-one -one with Chromebooks um, in my school. So right now we're one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, um, students in fourth through eighth grade. I also have iPods in my classroom, and I also have um, several desktop computers. So any way you slice it, uh, my students are going to be able to get on the internet and, uh, and fill out these forms. That's great. When do they fill them out? Is it is it always at the end? Is it does it depend on the form? It it really does depend on the form. Um, you could certainly do an entrance ticket if you wanted to. Um, you know, my station teaching. I have students doing forms at all times during the period, and then an exit ticket. You know, you'd probably do it at the end of the period. So whatever the tick, whatever the form is going to be used for, that would kind of do, uh, dictate when you were going to give it out. Okay. Can, can students use a smartphone to use these forms? Yes, they can. So any device that has an internet connection, um, you can give them the web address or you can send it to them via email and they would be able to complete the form. Can you set a time limit for the forms? Uh, for example, I wouldn't want my students to view a test before or after school, only work on it during school hours, say, as an example. Um, that's a great question. There's no real um, way to set that up. Um, obviously, you're going to have to give them the link to right. the form. They're not just going to be able to find right. it on their own. So one way you could get around that is if you send out the form during the period and after the period's over, um, when you go into the original form from your side, you can hit, you can select to stop 
um, accepting right. responses, uh -huh. so that way any student. Um, but there's also always right. a timestamp in the first column on your uh, responses, so you can see if students submitted responses after the allotted time. Great. What about modifications for students who need help even on a very simple form? That's also a great question. Um, I have students in my class who are 6th through 8th grade but read at a 2nd mm -hmm. grade reading level. Um, so on the Chromebooks there are extensions that will do text to speech uh, and will read the questions to the students. Um, or you know they can always just ask me to read them a question if necessary. Um, you can also use pictures on your forms um, to make mm -hmm. it a little bit easier for the students. Uh, so you, you have some options there. While creating MCQ type questions, how do you set the answer? So here's the thing. You do not mm -hmm. set the answer. Um, <laughs> if you, you have used something like Socrative or um, other versions of other things for a formative assessment that, you, that it grades it for you, um, forms do not mm -hmm. self-grade. However, there are scripts that you can run to grade your assignments if they are all multiple choice or one word answers, one uh, number answers. Uh, so a script like Fluberu you could run on your form and all you would have to do is take the form yourself and set that as the answer key and then you could grade it and then you can send out um, an email to your students with their grade. Is it difficult to set the answer in Fluberu? I think somebody is clarifying the question. Okay, yeah, so Fluberu, um, we don't really have time to go through how to do that right now, but um, what you would do is take the form yourself and whatever answers you put in would be the answer key, so it would just compare everything in the, so if you're looking at the form that I have up right now, if there was a correct answer to what is your dream vacation def destination, I would set maybe row two as the answer key and it would look at everything else in that column and grade it off of what I had written as my answer, as the correct answer. Okay. Um, so it's not difficult, um, it's, you know, it's it just, you have to make sure that you have a form that lends itself to using Fluberu. Uh, let's see about my other questions here. How hard is it to become a Google Apps for Education school? Well, um, I, <laughs> I haven't really sat through the process. Um, that was all of my tech coordinators. Sure. Um, it would be your school who would submit to be a Google Apps for Education school, not you personally. Um, so it would be either your administration or your tech coordinators would have to um, talk with the reps from Google, but it is mm -hmm. free. Um, so it, it would just be up to them to initiate it uh, to get the process started for your school or your district. Okay. I have a couple more here. Uh, one is, can you insert more than one image at a time or more than one video? Yes, you can. You can put um, several videos on one page. You can put several images on one page. Um, I had given an example of the art teacher um, who wanted to use the Google Forms. So what she had done was on one page she put up four different pictures of paintings and then she had them do a multiple choice which picture was, uh, you know, painted by Van Gogh and they had to choose picture one, picture two, picture three, or picture four as a multiple choice. Um, you can't select the actual picture as your answer, but you would either label them or give them a title and then students could select that mm -hmm. as a multiple choice or a checkbox or something like that. That's great. If Gmail is restricted from student use, how can students receive, or how can you um, see their their forms? I would think if it, if well, you you don't need an email okay. to fill out a form. Um, you would have students. Uh, you'd have to put in a name 
a box for them mm -hmm. to type in their name, and then you would just have to give them the uh, web address, and you could use a shortener like tinyurl or goo.gul and shorten the URL so it's easier for them to type in, and, uh, and that would really be the easiest way to do it. Or use a QR mm -hmm. code, that would mm -hmm. work too. I'm scanning my list here, which is lengthy. And also the, the current chat. I think I've captured all the ones that people asked, and I think I've already asked them. So thank you very much. Okay. Does anyone have a, a, thank you. I'm a, a question to ask over the mic? It's a little lengthy to type in for Melissa. If so, please raise your hand. Use that little hand icon. Or if you would like to share about how you use Google Forms, you can also take the mic. Okay, Jackie, let me give you the microphone. Go ahead. Hello? Can you hear me? Hi, Hi how are you? I'm good. I'm how good. Are you? Um, our district, the, the one question asked earlier about becoming a GAF school, it's really easy. If you've got an IT department that you can work with you, Google walks you through it. It's super easy. And we currently are using our forms for our parent survey for the LCAP. That's a great point, Jackie. We've done a couple things um, for parents via forms also and, and gotten some really great responses. The teachers, even in the classroom, when they're trying to solicit, solicit um, parent information about how are your kids doing their homework, how much time do you spend doing homework in the evening, so that you're sort of with the Google Forms helping the parents also learn so they can help the kids when they have a, a form to fill out at home. So it's sort of a two-way handshake. Definitely, and we've also used them in my district for um, setting up parent-teacher conferences. Um, that does require a little bit of coding, so uh, you know our IT department really handled that. But there are things you can do, like setting up conferences or um, you know sending out parent surveys, like you said. Um, and again, a really great way to get buy-in from the parents. Yeah, great class. I really learned a lot. I've been using it for about three years. I'm also a Google certified teacher and trainer. So um, yeah, it was really interesting. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Would someone else like to share how they use Google Forms? All right, let me give you the mic. Go ahead. Remember to push talk. Got to push the talk button at the top of the screen. Click on talk. Can you hear me? Now yeah. we can, yes. In my university, I am using the Google Docs for my students. Uh, for their career path in planning, I shared this link with you. This is the link. And Google Forms I am using for to conduct the surveys. That's great. Great. Thank you.
Would someone else like to share how they're using Google Forms? Sandra has her hand up as well. Let me switch the mic on. Don't forget to push talk, Sandra. Can you hear me? Sure can. can you hear me? Okay. Um, originally, I was using Google Forms to collect parent emails to put in my library database so I could automate overdue notices. But um, I also added on parent volunteer questions so I could find volunteers easily. And um, most recently, I was working with a teacher on starting a research project where he had students in groups. And they had each person in the group had to uh, identify several items that they were in charge of re researching for their group. And he was going to have them come up and write down all the things that they were each person was doing. And I said, um, wouldn't that be easier to collect that in a Google form? And he said, I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> I just pulled one up and made it really quick, you know, and by the second period then we were able to do that and he was amazed and so I think this is something I'm going to share with teachers in the coming days. Awesome. So thank you for all the updates on how to include images and video and all that. I love, love that too. I'm glad you liked it and, and forms is really so easy to pick up once you try it the first time. I mean it, you know you can create one the, Five minutes later, it's it's really easy once somebody shows it to you. So that, I'm so glad that you've shared it with your colleagues there, Sandra, and I hope that uh, you can share some more tips with them. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Sandra. And while you were talking, another question came into chat. Has anyone had students create a form? If so, what types of activities did you do that with? Well, uh, personally, I've had students um, create their own forms when we talked about um, data collection in uh, math and in science. So students would create their own mm -hmm. surveys um, that they would send out to, you know, we have uh, group emails for everyone in their grade so they could send them out that way. And I've also had students um, make a copy of a form uh, for when they were presenting a project to the class and students could give them feedback via the form. That's great. That's great. Paula, you have the mic now. Hi everyone, this is Paula from New Orleans. Um, I love using Google Forms with my students. And since I'm also a, an Edmodo user, I can um, embed the Google form into our Edmodo group and students have access that way since we are not a Google school at this time. But some of the things that I've done with it is um, we wanted to do a breakout uh, ed camp kind of session for professional development at our school several years ago. So the first thing I did was I created a Google Form survey that we sent out to teachers asking them their comfort level with technology and what they were the most interested in learning. And then from there, um, I was able to work with my um, administration and tech team to set up the breakout sessions for our next PD. And it was wonderful, and we've been doing that ever since. Uh, we started that about five years ago. So part of our PD is, you know, um, one kind of uh, sit and get session for everyone, and then in the afternoon we run breakout sessions so that we have some differenti differentiated PD going on. Also, my students have created um, Google Forms by using my Google account, since they don't have accounts, where we could collect data for our math class to um, do um, data collection and then graph it. And of course, since we also do video conferencing with other schools, what we do is we do a, a Skype or Google Hangout to collect the data. And then about, oh, maybe a week later, we uh, do another Hangout where we actually share the graphs that we've made from the data we collected. Also, during science class, we sent out a worldwide weather collection um, Google form 
and it was really fun for the kids to see weather all over the world and then figure out where those places were located. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. Do we have any other people wanting to share how they use Google Forms? If so, again, please raise your hand. If not, I'm going to go ahead and close the show. So upcoming shows for Classroom 2.0 Live. Next Saturday, March 8, 8 is the first Donors Choose show with Laura Candler and Francie Kugelman. March 15th is part two for Do Donors Choose with Rebecca Burkhoff, Jenny Jones, and Paula Noggle with their hashtag four chat success stories for Donors Choose. And March 22nd, Erin Klein will be the featured teacher. Steve Hargadon's newest project is the Learning Revolution. And he has created this to have a one place to go to for all of the PD that um, he organizes. So you have a one place event calendar of all the things that are coming up. Also, the host your own webinar is back here at Learning Revolution, that is, hosting your own. Blackboard Collaborate session. You can nominate a featured teacher with this form, tinyurl.com slash CR2O Live Featured Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. Uh, you can also nominate yourself as a featured teacher. As you exit the classroom, the link to the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open. And if it doesn't, it'll be in the chat box. It's also in the live binder. So there's three different places to get the survey. When you complete the survey for today's show, you can request a professional development certificate. That's towards the bottom of the show. Uh, for the email address that you put there, for the request, please make it a personal email rather than a school email, because if it's a school email address, this may get blocked by your spam filter. The video collection and audio collection for the archives, including for today's show, is available at uh, iTunes U. This is the, the link, tinyurl.com slash CR2Olive iTunes U. The archives are also available at the RS, RSS feed link, which is on the Classroom 2.0 Live website. So there are many ways to get to the archives. Uh, a special thanks to Melissa Murphy, who's our special guest today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in the show. Thank you all for coming. Uh, please remember that in order for that recording to process, uh, you must exit the classroom. <laughs>